Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to testify today about mandatory minimums. If I told you that one out of three African American males is forbidden by law from voting, you might think I was talking about Jim Crow 50 years ago. Yet today, a third of African Americans are still prevented from voting because of the war on drugs. The war on drugs definitely affected young black males. The ACLU reports that blacks are four to five times be convicted for drug possession, although surveys indicate that blacks and whites use drugs at about the same similar rate. The majority of illegal drug users and dealers nationwide are white, but three-fourths of the people in prison for drug offenses are African American or Latino. Why are arrest rates so lopsided? Because it's frankly easier to go into the urban areas and make arrests than it is to go into suburban areas. Arrest statistics matter when applying for federal grants. It doesn't take much imagination to understand that it's easier to round up, arrest, and convict poor kids than it is to convict rich kids. The San Jose Mercury News reviewed 700,000 criminal cases that were matched by crime and criminal history of the defendant. The analysis revealed that similarly situated whites were far more successful than African Americans and Latinos in the plea bargaining process. In fact, at virtually every stage of pretrial negotiation, whites are more successful than non-whites. I know a my age in Kentucky who grew marijuana plants in his apartment closet in college. 30 years later, he still can't vote, can't own a gun, and when he looks for work, he must check the box. The box that basically says, I'm a convicted felon, and I guess I'll always be one. He hasn't been arrested or convicted for 30 years, but he can't vote. He doesn't have his Second Amendment rights, and getting a job is nearly impossible for him. Today, I'm here to ask you to create a safety valve for all federal mandatory minimums. Mandatory sentencing automatically imposes a minimum number of years in prison for specific crimes, usually related to drugs. By design, mandatory sentencing laws take discretion away from judges so as to impose often harsh sentences regardless of circumstances. Since mandatory sentencing began, Americans' prison population has exploded, quadrupled, 2.4 million people in jail. America now jails a higher percentage of citizens than any other country in the world at a staggering cost of $80 billion a year. Recently, Chairman Lay and I introduced the Justice Safety Valve Act. This legislation is short and simple. It amends current law to provide authority to impose a sentence below a statutory mandatory minimum. In other words, we're not repealing mandatory minimums, although I probably would. What we're doing is merely allowing a judge to sentence below a mandatory minimum if certain requirements are met. There is an ex existing safety valve, some will argue, yet it's very limited. It has a strict five-part test, and only about 23% of all drug offenders are qualified for the safety valve. The injustice of mandatory minimum sentences is impossible to ignore when you hear the stories of the victims. John Horner was a 46-year-old father of three when he sold some of his prescription painkillers to a friend. His friend turned out to be a police informant, and he was charged with dealing drugs. Horner pleaded guilty and was sentenced to a mandatory minimum of 25 years in jail. He'll be nearly 80, like the other people we've heard from earlier. Edward Clay, 18 years old, was a first-time offender when he was caught with less than two ounces of cocaine. He received 10 years in jail for a mandatory minimum sentence. Weldon Angelos, who the chairman mentioned, was 24 years old and was given 55 years in prison for selling marijuana. There is no justice here. It is wrong and it needs to change. Federal Judge Timothy Lewis recalls a case where he had to send a 19-year-old to prison for conspiracy. What was the conspiracy? The young man was in a car where drugs were found. I don't know about you, and this is Judge Lewis, but I'm pretty sure one of us might have been in a car in our youth at one point in time where there might have been drugs in the car. Imagine this, and I'm glad the president has such great compassion because he's admitted, like a lot of other individuals who are now elected to office, that at one time he made mistakes as a youth. And I think what a tragedy it would have been at Egon to prison. What a tragedy it would have been if America wouldn't have gotten to see Barack Obama as a leader. 
I just don't know why we can't come together and do something about this. Each case, I think, should be judged on its own merits. Mandatory minimums prevent this from happening. Mandatory minimum sentencing, I think, has done little to address the real problem of drug abuse while also doing a great deal of damage by destroying so many lives. I'm here to ask today for you to let judges to start doing their job. I'm here to ask that we begin today the end of mandatory minimum sentencing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.